Hello and welcome in or welcome back to the channel. My name is Megan and today we're going to be discussing four more decades old cold cases that have recently been solved and closed, answering questions that families have been asking for years and in some cases serving long awaited justice. Case number four, Joyce Casper. In 1987, the city of Boise was shook by the murder of 65-year-old Joyce Casper. She was found strangled to death inside her car a few blocks away from the store that she owned on Vista Avenue. Now, that murder went unsolved for 36 years until this week. On Friday, Boise police announced that they had solved the case. And earlier today, police detectives and Casper's family gathered at City Hall where they finally got some closure. And News Channel 7's Jude Binkley was there. Jude, uh, quite a day for the family there. Absolutely, Joe. It's been a very long time coming, but detectives said they were confident this day would come as they finally were able to close the book on this 36-year-old murder. A mother. She was just really generous of spirit. A murder. It impacted this community in a massive way. And 36 years later, a mystery uncovered. We solved it. The, this case is now closed. A case that stayed with Lance Anderson. I was the first detective from the Violent Crimes Unit that made it to the scene. It was on October 13, 1987 in Boise, Idaho, when Joyce Casper was found in her car just a few blocks from her business, Casper's Vista Hallmark and Gift Shop. She had been murdered, and her death would shake the community. Joyce was 65 years old when she died. Joyce is well known in the community to be kind and caring. She and her husband, who was a pharmacist, owned a pharmacy until 1986, until they opened Casper's Vista Hallmark and Gift Shop. Her husband, John Casper, had died in 1982, and Joyce continued to run the shop after his death. John and Joyce had three children together, two daughters and one son. Joyce was known to work late, and it wasn't odd for her to be at the shop until very late in the evening. So, she could have been attacked any time between the evening of October 12th and the early morning of October 13th. Authorities would eventually release that they believed Joyce had been abducted from her shop, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death before being put in her car and driven away. Another significant piece of evidence was that Joyce had reported being attacked in her shop two weeks prior to her murder. But she had managed to scare him off, and the attacker had run away quickly. During the encounter, he had attempted to assault her. She reported that the man was in his late teens, early twenties, with slicked back black hair. Police never found this man, nor the man who had killed Joyce. The case would go cold very quickly, with no witnesses and very little evidence that could be used in 1987, and all the leads soon dried up. But in 1988, another attack similar to Joyce's reopened the case. Another woman in her 60s had been attacked, but in her case, her attacker was found quickly and denied having any involvement with Joyce's case, even though there were several similarities. The case would again turn cold, and it would stay that way for decades. It was reopened in 2005 when they took another look at the evidence that had been preserved in 1987. However, at that time, nothing new came up. But in 2017, two detectives were assigned permanently to the case, and scientific advancements had caught up with DNA analysis. They sent a DNA sample, believed to have been from the suspect, to Parabon Nanolabs, and they were able to create a computer-generated profile of the potential suspect. They would release that they believed the suspect was Latin American possibly from Puerto Rico or Colombia. The data from the genetic markers would reveal that he had brown or hazel eyes, brown or black hair, and that he didn't have freckles. In 2017, they would admit that some of this, like the hair, may have changed in the 30 years since the murder, but that they had hoped someone would recognize the composite image created by their program. In 2019, a new detective would start to work the case this time working with Identifinders International in the hopes of using genetic genealogy to help find a suspect. This analysis would take until 2023 to reveal the suspect. And it was in July 2023 when the Boise Police Department announced they had found a suspect in the 36-year-old cold case, Frank A. Rodriguez. Unfortunately, no rest could be made as Rodriguez had died in 2007 by suicide. Authorities met with his family, taking DNA swabs, which were analyzed and proved through genetics that Rodriguez was the suspect. 
Even though he had passed, both the retired Boise detectives that had worked the case and the Casper family were relieved to have some answers about what had happened to Joyce after all this time. Rodriguez had a history of violent outbursts, mental health issues, and substance abuse, but he didn't have a criminal record. At the time of Joyce's murder, he would have only been 17 years old, and he lived only blocks away from the store. He spent the rest of his life living in the area and is being investigated in connection to other cold cases in Idaho. Rodriguez's physical description at the time also matched report Joyce gave from the attempted assault that had taken place at her store two weeks prior to her murder. Police have asked if anyone knows anything about Frank A. Rodriguez to contact the Boise police as they believe this is probably not his only crime. Case number three, Jewel Parchman Langford. It was on May 3, 1975, when a farmer was checking the back end of his property near the Nation River, about 40 kilometers east of Ottawa, Canada. He noticed something floating in the river, and there he found a woman's body face down in the water. Before doing anything, he called the police. The Ottawa Police Department arrived and discovered a woman's bloated, naked body with a cloth covering her face. She had a dark blue leotard top bunched up around her neck, her hands had been bound in front of her with a blue necktie with Canadian flags, and her ankles had also been bound with two additional men's ties. The cloth around her head was described as two pieces of a bloody green fabric, a disposable hand towel, and a distinctive Irish linen tea towel. Loosely wrapped around her neck was a television cable and a piece of a curtain rod runner could be found in her armpit. The autopsy would put her age between 25 and 35. She had shoulder-length dyed red hair that was believed to have been brown naturally, with hazel or blue eyes, believed to be about 100 pounds, and she was 5 foot 5 tall. Both her fingers and toenails were painted red. She had a high-quality partial dentures with multiple fillings, having police believe that she was of a middle-class background. They stated that it appeared she'd never had children, and she'd had her appendix removed. She'd also eaten a large meal right before her death. Her larynx had been fractured, and her case was ruled a homicide. Due to the nature of the body's decomposition, they couldn't determine if she'd been sexually assaulted. Her body was believed to have been in the river for about one to four weeks, putting her time of death between April 5th and April 26th. Police believe she'd been dumped in the river from a nearby bridge. When they investigated, they found blood on the bridge. It wasn't enough to get a blood type at that time, but they assumed it was from the woman. There had been heavy rain on April 19th, so that led authorities to believe she'd been dumped between the 19th and the 26th. All of this information and police had one key piece missing. They couldn't identify the woman. They combed hundreds of missing persons reports. They contacted dentists locally as the Jane Doe had a custom denture made for her and several fillings. Their forensic dental imprints were published in dental journals in North America and overseas, but no one recognized them. Law enforcement knocked on doors in a 25 kilometer radius of the bridge. They tracked down where the TV cable had been sold and checked hotels and motels where it might have been installed, but nothing. The necktie that had bound her had been made in Montreal and sold all over Ontario and Quebec. The tea towel from Ireland was imported by a Toronto company and sold in mass quantities until 1972. Nothing seemed to spark any leads. Without knowing who the woman was, the police had very little to go on. Was she from Canada? Was she a visitor? Had she recently moved here? Had she come from Montreal, or was just dumped near Ottawa, which, at the time, was a technique often used by criminals to confuse detectives? She would be dubbed the Nation River Lady, and she'd stay in a Toronto morgue until 1987, 12 years after the discovery. She was eventually buried in Toronto Mount Pleasant Cemetery. News of her burial would bring in some fresh tips, but would lead to dead ends. The Nation River Lady would be in the news every few years, with new sketches and advancements, but still they couldn't identify the woman. It wasn't until 2023 when Canadian officials would announce that they not only had identified the Nation River Lady, but had a suspect in custody. 
The Nation River Lady was identified as Jewel Parchman Langford, who was 48 when she died and had traveled from her hometown in Tennessee and moved to Montreal in April 1975. She was a successful businesswoman who owned a spa with her ex-husband, and she'd been well missed by her family, who'd reported her missing shortly after not hearing from her in 1975. Her parents and siblings had all passed by the time she was identified, but she still had some nieces who helped identify her after all these years. Jewel was identified after her body was exhumed in 2019 for a new DNA profile, which the Canadian authorities shared with US-based DNA Doe Project. Using genetic genealogy, they could upload the results into the database shared with the police. Quickly, they found a match and had new samples taken from living relatives, which Canadian labs confirmed. They'd been able to make the announcement privately with the family in 2020 that they had identified Jewel. This was kept out of the press in the hopes of finding more information about her killer. The suspect was also identified via genetic genealogy. Florida native Rodney Nichols is now 81 years old and was living in Montreal and worked as a professional rugby player at the time of the murder. It would come out that Nichols had been dating Jewel at the time. It is being reported that once he was arrested, he confessed to the murder, but this is now being called into question by his lawyer. In the confession, he said that he killed her because she had lied about her age, being 48 when he was only 32. Nichols had previously been investigated in connection to her disappearance, but he claimed to have lied to law enforcement when Jewel had been reported missing, saying he had heard from her and she was well and in Vancouver. Nichols is not being investigated for any other cold cases at this time. The Ottawa government is now working on extraditing Nichols to Canada, hoping he will face charges in Ottawa. This case is still ongoing and Nichols has not been convicted at this time. Jules' family is glad to have answers, and in 2022, they had a small ceremony after her body had been sent back to Tennessee, where her grave marker was changed from missing to finally home and at peace. Number 2. Cornelia Humphrey it was on April 20th, 1978, when a woman named Cornelia Humphrey was murdered in Germany when she was 18. She was found the day after the murder, with her body dumped on the roadside with 14 stab wounds in her neck and back. Witness came forward early on in the investigation, saying that they saw a small car with a green license plate in the area. The American military station in Germany often used the green license plate. It was discovered that Cornelia had been having an extramarital affair with a man named Tommy Molina. He was 24 at the time. He was stationed in Germany with his first wife and he owned a Fiat 124, which matched the description of the car seen leaving Cornelia's body. He was interviewed five days after Cornelia was discovered, but he said he'd been home with his wife that day. However, she couldn't remember. The German authorities and the American military didn't have much, and he was not charged at that time. He would be interviewed again, but not until 1996, after his now third wife reported to military officials that while intoxicated in 95, he confessed multiple times to her that he had killed a woman in Germany with a knife. He told her he was having an affair and that she'd gotten pregnant and had threatened to tell his wife. Again, he was questioned in 1996 and he strongly denied any involvement, and the investigation moved slowly again after that. But later, with advancements in DNA technology, the investigators reopened the case. In 2019, the German government requested a new blood sample taken from Cornelia's body. Federal warrant was issued, and in 2020, they collected fresh DNA, and in 2021, they confirmed the match of DNA that was collected off Cornelia's clothing to Tommy Molina. Tommy Molina is now 69 years old. He was arrested on June 21, 2023 and charged with the murder of Cornelia Humphrey. He is currently awaiting extradition to Germany, where he could face 15 years in prison if convicted. Case number one, Herbert Broom. It was on April 16, 1991 at approximately 3 a.m. when Toronto police officers responded to a 911 call at 149 Dundas Street East, just west of Jarvis Street in Toronto, Canada. 
Officers would find a man suffering from multiple stab wounds. The victim soon died at the scene. He would later be identified as Herbert Boone, a 43-year-old Toronto resident originally from Newfoundland. Herbert didn't live in the apartment he was found. It was known to be a short-term or low-rent apartment. Police would find evidence that the killer had washed out the blood in the bathroom and the killer had thrown his blood-soaked clothes in a nearby dumpster. His murder case would quickly go cold. Toronto police couldn't connect anyone to the crime. However, in June 2023, Toronto police announced that they had positively identified the killer. They identified Kevin Welsh, who they stated they'd used DNA testing on preserved evidence to determine the Toronto residence was the killer. Walsh was 46 years old at the time of killing, and it's not known what sparked the altercation. Fortunately, Kevin Walsh died in 2007. Authorities said that if he were alive today, he could be charged with one count of second-degree murder. Police have not released what DNA technology was used to identify Walsh, but they did release that it was Walsh who was staying in the apartment where Boone had been found in 1991. However, authorities are still asking anyone with information about the murder to contact Toronto Police at 416-808-7400 or Crime Stoppers anonymously at 416-222-8477. Well, that's going to be it for this video. What are your thoughts? For more cases like this, click here for our Solved Cold Case playlist. And if you see anything you want me to cover next, let me know. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. I'll see you all in the next video. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.